Thank you so much, Susanna, and, and, and thanks a lot to all the speakers. It's, it's fantastic to hear about the project um, and, and how the methodology is evolving and the tool you're coming up with and the fact that it kind of works you know, across industry and the DPAs, which is, you know, it, it's so important to be at that middle ground of, of discussing um, discussing these issues and coming up with solution. Um, absolutely fantastic to hear. And, um, you know, for the last half an hour of this stage, we will be uh, focusing on uh, handling standard contractual clauses. Marcus has touched upon it in the beginning. We've heard about it in, in the panel discussion as well. Uh, they have certainly kept all of us uh, policy people uh, busy over, over the last few months. So um, I will uh, hand over to Paul in a minute uh, to introduce himself and also um, uh, present um, uh, the, the topic to all of you. And as ever, please do use the, the chat function or raise your hand uh, if you have any questions and I'll come to you after the presentation. So Paul, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is uh, Paul, Paul Voigt. I'm a partner with Taylor Wissing at Attorney at Law and specialized in tax transactions and particular privacy and in the privacy space in particular uh, with everything that uh, has an international touch. Uh, so cross-border transfers it has always been quite a big part of my practice. And I'm happy to be able to speak or rather discuss maybe with you uh, the new Senate contractual clauses and the issues they may pose in practice sometimes, at least. I will share my slides in a second. Should work like this. Can you see it? Wonderful. All right. And before I go into the details relating to the new standard contractual clauses, I think it makes sense to zoom out for a second. Um, I won't go into detail, but still, um, assessing why do we need those clauses and what are the requirements for applying them in practice, I think that does make sense. And as you all know, of course, whenever you transfer personal data to another entity, even within Europe, you need to be transparent about the respective data transfers. You need a, a legal basis for transferring the data, even if the data remains within the European Union. But if you transfer personal data outside the borders of the European Union and the European economic area, you can't rely on the data importer having a similar, similar level of data protection laws in place as we have within the EU. Within the EU, of course, uh, it is a given that GDPR and respective accompanying laws apply. So we have a harmonized level of data protection. The same is, of course, not true if you leave the European Union and similar or different laws will apply. So the entire idea of the GDPR, but very similarly also uh, the European um, Data Protection Directive before that, is that when you transfer personal data outside of the protected scope of the European Union to a third country, you need to implement additional safeguards with the data importer to ensure that the data importer basically applies similar standards as we have them in the Euro European Union. And... As you all know, there are different kinds of safeguards. We had the privacy shield in the past, uh, of which you all know that it has uh, uh, it does not apply any longer. We have binding corporate rules for uh, data transfers within, within corporate groups. That, that's not a tool that is used very often in practice, but sometimes it is. And of course, we have the standard contractual clauses. And the current, or let's say the current until yesterday or day before yesterday, version of the standard contractual clauses has been quite old. So we have clauses going back, and back until 2001, as others until 2004 or 2010. So very old clauses that have actually been yeah, uh, drafted uh, without having GDPR in mind because they have been publicized a long time before GDPR has ever entered um, the game. Um, and of course, those clauses have not been fully aligned or had not been fully aligned with GDPR. And the European Commission had always promised to update the existing standard contractual clauses in order to fulfill the requirements of GDPR. But this has not happened until there was actually a trigger last year. Um, mid of last year, as you all know, the European Court of Justice came up with its uh, famous or, or maybe infamous FREMS 2 decision. Um, setting up additional hurdles for cross-border data transfers. When you relied on standard contractual clauses in the past, 
basically what 99.9% .9 of the data importers did was just sign that piece of paper and put it into the shelf and never think about it again. Actually, uh, we, we have... In Europe, we have discussed a lot about privacy shield and safe harbor, et cetera, and how bad the protection is. But from my practice, I can say, generally, if an importer has implemented privacy shield, they may not have done as much as we would have wanted them to do, but they at least have run through a compliance process in the US to set up something. When they have signed up to SECs, very often they have not done anything, at least the smaller ones. Uh, so the protection very often was actually worse under standard contractual clauses than under privacy shield. Be that um, as it may, the European Court of Justice in uh, 2020 said, you can no longer do that. You can no longer uh, sign the standard contractual clauses in the check the box exercise. The standard contractual clauses themselves, they may still be valid and you can still rely on them for transferring data outside of the data outside the European Union but you cannot rely on them alone because the Senate contractual clauses are a bilateral agreement between the data exporter in the EU and the data importer outside the EU. And of course, it will only bind the parties and not a third party such as an authority in the US, for example, who will still be able to request access to personal data. So basically what the European Court of Justice, as you all know, said, in addition to concluding the standard contractual clauses, you will have to do a transfer impact assessment and assess the level of protection the personal data receives outside the European Union. And as you all know, and without uh, going uh, into that in detail, the EDPB has come up with recommendations on how to do that in practice. And we just uh, spoken uh, about that uh, over the last two sessions. So still, um, this um, this Schrems II decision was finally um, uh, the trigger for the European Commission to come up with new and adapted standard contractual clauses um, that now apply under GDPR and which which we have to deal with now. The clauses have been uh, published in June and they have already applied since June and could be used, but in addition or in parallel, the old clauses could also be used. So until yesterday, actually, you could um, apply the old clauses. Since yesterday, this is no longer possible. Since yesterday, whenever you transfer personal data outside of the European Union and you want to rely on standard contractual clauses for doing so, you will have to use the new standard contractual clauses. The old ones are no longer um, applicable. They keep on applying, though, for existing transfers. So if you have signed those clauses until 26 September of this year, then you keep can keep on using them until the end of next year. But by then, you will have to have switched to the new clauses. And this will be, as I mentioned before, no longer be a mere check-the-box exercise, just signing the agreements. But this can actually be a very, very burdensome process. What is new with the new standard contractual clauses? There are actually quite a few things that are new. And one important issue is that the scope of application is now different than it was under the old clauses. The old clauses basically said, we have to be, we, the clauses have to be concluded between a data exporter established in the European Union or a European economic area and a data importer established outside the European Union. This brought problems uh, uh, along as well because uh, it did not fit with all cases, but at least it was relatively clear-cut. It is no longer as clear-cut with the new clauses. So the place of establishment is no longer the main trigger for the respective standard contractual clauses, but rather the question whether GDPR applies or not. So as a data exporter, the new clauses can be concluded by anyone established within the European Union as a data exporter but also by companies established outside the European Union to the extent that GDPR applies to them. So for example, you may be a US-based company that uh, provides uh, goods or services to individuals in the EU and the destin destination principle of GDPR may kick in. And then you can be a data exporter under these new standard contractual clauses, despite the fact that you're not even within the EU. With respect to the data importers, uh, it is similar. You have to be actually established outside the EU, but, and this is what the clauses say, uh, the 
GDPR must not apply to you. So uh, based on the understanding of the clauses, if GDPR applies to you, you cannot be an importer under those clauses. And this, um, again, opens uh, um, um, a box of problems, again, because similar uh, as with the data exporters, a data importer can perfectly be subject to the destination principle under GDPR and respectively fall under GDPR despite being established outside the European Union. So you can have a case where you send data to a data importer in the US who is actually subject to GDPR. According to what the commission decision with respect to the standard contractual clauses says, you cannot rely on these new standard contractual clauses for such a transfer. The problem is the European authorities will tell you that you still have to rely on something. This is still considered a cross-border transfer that needs to be safeguarded in line with GDPR requirements. But when you then start looking for a tool that allows you to do this transfer, you will, in 95% of the cases, find out that there is none. So basically, the standard contractual clauses cannot be used, but should be used. So that leaves you with nothing. Very often, you will then have to decide whether you just sign them anyway, yeah, knowing that they do not fully uh, work here, uh, or not doing anything. Probably just signing them will still be the better option. At least you have something in place, some kind of defensible position, even if it does not fully work. The fact that you have a less clear scope of application um, actually makes dealing with those standard contractual clauses much more difficult. Uh, for example, in intergroup agreements on intergroup relationships. Yeah, Before it was quite clear cut, you had a data transfer from an exporter in the EU to a data importer outside the EU. You knew in your intergroup agreement, for example, you could just sign the standard contractual clauses. Now it's getting more difficult. Now you may have uh, among your dozens of non-European companies, you may suddenly have exporters, which you don't even know of. Theoretically, you would have to assess for each of your transfers within the group, even if they take place outside of the European Union, whether they fall under the scope of the new standard contractual clauses and whether they fall uh, under the uh, destination principle of GDPR, which can be very, very burdensome in particular if you try to standardize pro processes in that regard and, um, uh, and don't want to look at each date, um, data transfer in much detail. The new clauses are also um, quite different from the look and feel uh, in comparison with the old clauses. So the old clauses, you had one set of documents for each, each um, kind of transfer. So you had one contract for controller to controller transfers, you had another set uh, um, for controller to processor transfers. That is no longer the case here. You have a, a modular agreement with four different modules, um, which you can sign as is, yeah, by just saying, look, um, only module two applies, for example, and retain this very, very complicated and difficult to read contract, but that is um, legally perfectly possible. Another possibility is to sort out which of the modules you actually need and just sign, for example, the controller to controller module or the controller to processor module. Interestingly, the European Commission has not published the different modules separately, so you have to go through the agreement either manually and find out which agreement you want to conclude or use one of the many SEC generators that are now available online. So what modules do we have? The first one is a, a module controller to controller. That is a data transfer from a controller based subject to GDPR to a controller not subject to GDPR. It is comparatively similar to the setup we know already. We already do have uh, these controller to controller clauses and the new ones are much more detailed a bit more burdensome and, and more adapted to GDPR than the old ones. But other than that, there are at least no huge surprises included in that regard. Similar, uh, similar it is with the controller to processor transfers. We already know the controller to processor clauses from the 2010 version of the commission. And generally speaking, this is a similar concept here as well. What is actually quite good is that now, and that is different from the old version. The new clauses specifically include an Article 28 data processing agreement. So you don't have to conclude any kind of DPA in addition to the standard contractual clauses. 
And we asked actually quite often uh, by, by clients whether they should still conclude those uh, their DPAs on top of the standard contractual clauses. And I would say in most cases, that not, does not really make sense because you don't need it anymore. And you would potentially have two conflicting agreements and then you have to sort out what applies in which scenario that makes it a bit burdensome. Then we have two new modules that we do not know yet. The one is processor to processor. And this is actually one that has been um, requested by the industry for ages. Basically, in this scenario, you will have a data processor that is established in the EU, that is subject to GDPR, in most cases established within the European Union, and a processor established outside the European Union. And in the old world, with the old clauses, at least from the view of the authorities, with which I uh, do not always fully agree in that regard, but at least from the view of the authorities, that mean, meant that if you have been a controller in the EU and used a processor in the EU, you were obliged to conclude standard contractual clauses with all the subprocessors of your processor in the EU. So in addition to the one DBA that you had in place with your processor in the EU, you had maybe 20 standard contractual clauses in place with the subprocessors that were engaged by your uh, processor. That obviously it was very, very difficult to handle in practice, and this is no longer required. So if you're a European controller and take advantage of a European processor, you don't have to conclude standard contractual clauses any longer, but the processor will actually be the one that needs to conclude these standard contractual clauses. And the processor, this is also new, will be the data exporter in that regard. Yeah. So in the past, because the controller concluded the standard contractual clauses, Basically, the controller had to do the transfer impact assessment. Here, um, now, I would argue, at least in the first instance, it is the processor that needs to be the one who does the transfer impact assessment and who concludes the standard contractual clauses, which is obviously makes things easier for the controllers in the EU. It is good to have this new module. However, it changes processes. Yeah, because before you had the direct relationship controller subprocessor. Um, and you will probably, for example, in intergroup agreements, you will actually have to yeah, wiggle a bit uh, with the existing agreements uh, to adapt that to the new system. But generally, it is favorable to have this module three and the standard contractual clauses. I would argue it is differently with module four, processor to controller, which is a very strange module. Um, basically, if you are a controller, let's say in the US, and GDPR does not apply to you, and then you use, let's say, a hosting provider in the European Union, suddenly, when you put something into the cloud in Europe, you don't have to do anything as a controller because you're not subject to GDPR. But the second the pro you, you take the data back, this is considered, at least under those clauses, a, a transfer back to the United States that is subject to this module four of the standard contractual clauses. Very strange. So basically the processor in Europe will have to put an additional burden on the controller who could perfectly just look for a processor outside of Europe um, without any kind of restrictions from GDPR. So a bit of a hurdle for business, uh, for doing business for processes in the EU. And which is also bizarre uh, because in addition to this module four, very likely you will also need to conclude a data processing agreement according to Article 28 GDPR. Because while the Article 28 GDPR uh, DPA is concluded in Module 2 and Module 3, it is not included in Module 4. But still, you have an agreement in place between a controller and a processor, and the processor very likely will be obliged to push down a data processing agreement even to the non-European controller, and this is not concluded, included in these standard contractual clauses, which makes it quite difficult to deal with as well. As I mentioned before, SRAMS 2, the SRAMS 2 decision by the European Court of Justice was actually the, probably the main trigger for the European Commission to come up with the newly drafted standard contractual clauses. And you can also see that SRAMS 2 had, had quite a big impact on the content of the clauses. So we have one clause, clause 15, which sets out specific obligations of the data importer uh, when dealing with access requests of, of authorities. So for example, if a data importer in the, Europe, in the United States receive an access request by um, an authority, 
they are obliged by the clauses to inform the data exporter to the extent that this is legally possible. They are obliged to minimize the data that they provide to the authorities. So they must not provide bulk access to the database, but rather only provide access to the specific data sets that are requested by the authority. And to the extent that the data importer believes that the request may not fully be in line with applicable law, they will also have to take uh, legal recourse against the request by the authority. In addition to that, in uh, the clause 14, the TIA obligations, the transfer impact assessment obligations have been specifically included into the clauses. So uh, the data exporter is no longer required to do the T TIA only due to the Schrems 2 decision and only due to the EDPB guidance on the respective um, supplementary measure. But in addition, the transfer impact assessment has now specifically become a contractual obligation between the parties. So basically, both parties will have to work together and do a transfer impact assessment relating to the law and practices at the place of, of, of the data importer. And they have to warrant in that agreement, so they have to provide a warranty that they don't have any uh, doubts that the um, uh, data importer can actually live up to the expectations that are set out in this respective SEC document, which is quite uh, yeah, an additional step and which is the reason why you can no longer conclude those agreements in a check the box way. If you did without doing the transfer impact assessment, you would be right away in contract breach. The SECs likely include some kind of risk-based approach and risk-based approach is uh, something that the authorities claim does not exist at all when it comes to cross-border transfers. Uh, but I would argue that there must be some kind of risk-based approach in that regard. Um, because basically the clauses say that when assessing the law and the practices at the uh, place of the data importer, you can also take into account how likely it is that they will actually receive respective access requests by um, authorities in, um, in their country. And this assessment, I believe, must to some extent be risk-based um, because in most cases, and that is the overall nature of these, um, um, these secret agencies is that they, they don't run around and tell everyone under what circumstances uh, they act and under, one, under what circumstances they will request access to data. So very often, it is not known neither to the data exporter nor the data importer under what requirements they can actually access data. Of course, you, there will, uh, in uh, democracies, there will be laws available that you can read, but what that actually means in practice may not be as clear as you might hope for. And actually, uh, the reason that we know so much about the US is also due to the fact that uh, Mr. Snowden has uh, revealed uh, quite a lot of information uh, a couple of years ago and had made actually the practices of the US very transparent, much more transparent of um, than the um, respective um, yeah, activities in other countries. So, Basically, what you will do have is always to do some kind of prediction. Will there be likely some kind of access possibilities for authorities? And because this is a prediction and you don't with 100% certainty know the answer because it's just impossible to know, I think at least in that regard, it is impossible to live without a risk-based approach. In any case, whatever you did here, whatever you assessed, you will have to document it and provide it to the supervisory authorities on their request. What else is in the clauses? So similar to the old clauses, you must not amend the standard contractual clauses because if you do, you lose the respective protection. Similar, but much, much broader than under the old clauses, you have third party rights. So the individuals, the data subjects will be able to enforce the clauses to a large extent. And what you also have, and which is new, is you have a hierarchy clause, which sets out specifically that if you conclude other agreements uh, that are in conflict with the standard contractual clauses, the standard contractual clauses shall always um, prevail over the other agreements. And which is quite interesting, you have a specific liability clause, which basically sets out unlimited liability for both parties. And because this is, you have the hierarchy clause at the same time, this also means that you cannot a step away from this broad liability relating to the data transfers in the main agreement, something that we have seen actually happen quite often in the past. So 
liability limitation is at least much, much more difficult uh, in future when it comes to respective cross-border transfers. Uh, you can uh, more freely uh, choose a, a European law, so it does not necessarily have to be the law at the place of the data exporter, which was uh, the case in the past, which is quite interesting um, as long as this European law um, allows for third-party rights. Um, and this was, for example, not the case with respect to Ireland in the past, but they have just very recently changed the law, so at least with respect to uh, privacy, uh, the privacy um, landscape, uh, I believe uh, even in Ireland, you have those third-party rights possibilities now, and uh, at least to my knowledge, but I would be happy if someone has a differing uh, information, this was the last country where this was really difficult relating to the third-party rights, so probably you can choose every European law here right now. What does it mean for you um, uh, going forward? What do you have to do right now? So basically, regardless of whether you are an exporter or an importer, you have to do some kind of data mapping, understanding what kind of data flows do you have actually, in particular, if an exporter, where does the data flow to, which countries? And this sounds easy, and you might think that you should have the information readily available, available in the data inventory and in your records of processing activities, but very often in practice you don't. Uh, and even if you have it on a very broad level, you usually won't know uh, which specific country does the data flow to. Uh, you may not find the agreements uh, that are linked to the respective data flows. Very, very often finding the, the agreements is very burdensome. Very often clients start saying, well, we only have, I don't know, five or 10 uh, cross-border data transfers. And if they start digging, they find out it's not five or 10, but it's rather 50 or 100 because uh, things come out in the end, uh, slowly. So this data mapping exercise actually is quite a big piece of the respective work. And once you've found out what kind of data flows you have and to what uh, countries those data flows, then you have to set up some kind of project if, if it's more than just two or three. And basically you have to understand who do you have to involve uh, to find out which, uh, which contracts you have? To, uh, who do you have to involve maybe from your uh, IT team, maybe from legal to negotiate uh, the standard contractual clauses? Who is the dedicated person for keeping track of uh, the respective pro progress? So you have to have some kind of project planning in place and you will have to come up with a more or less standardized project, process for doing the transfer impact assessments. Because... Of course, the data importers very often will assist you in the transfer impact assessment process, at least the bigger ones, they will come up with standardized information so uh, you actually are still able to buy US and uh, other third country products, but still your transfer impact assessment process should look the same for vendor A as it should look for vendor B. So you have to come up with some kind of standardized assessment so you have actually something to document and to show to the authority if it would be required. And then, of course, prepare for switching to your existing SEC to the new SEC until end of next year. And I can only emphasize that sounds like a long time, but we also know from GDPR projects, etc., time runs really quickly and you'll find out uh, uh, very soon that this is not as much time as you might have thought. And of course, last but not least, whatever you do, you have to document it properly. And of course, this is a very fast moving uh, space. You have to constantly re-evaluate what measures have you taken? Um, where does the market go? Uh, do you need to adapt that? I think that is a work in progress. Um, you'll have to start and adapt it along the way. That's it in a nutshell. Happy to hear any kind of questions or I don't know, uh, differing opinions. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I haven't seen any questions in the chat, but if anyone has any, you know, 30 seconds question, please uh, jump in. <laughs> um, I am going to give you 10 seconds to kind of, you know, raise a hand or say in the chat that you'd like to ask a question so you can, you know, jump in. I will thank Paul for, for the very detailed presentation. I found that last slide of what to do. Uh, particularly heavy if you have to mm -hmm. think about kind of complying um you know there will be uh there will be a lot of steps to take and a lot of things to consider before you are kind of up to speed with 
uh, with the new SCCs. Um, so I think that means we don't really have questions. So uh, Which, that's the for, first time uh, speaking about uh, contractual clauses that there are no questions. Usually, like there, there doesn't. Go, but maybe there you go. Maybe that means that everyone has already uh, uh, taken care of implementing them because the deadline passed yesterday. So, uh, well, I'm afraid, Paul, there is still a question answered. in the chat. So yeah. Someone is asking about clause 14, um, A and B. Who seems appropriate to give such warranties? Is there any reason to verify whether signatories have the capacity? Um, ah, I mean, uh, same uh, same as always. I mean, it's a contract. You have to uh, ensure that whoever signs the contract should be able to represent the company. <laughs> uh, and of course, I mean, as always, um, take any information you get with a grain of salt uh, and maybe double check it. So our advice is usually, I mean, you, you of course have to rely to some extent on whatever the data importer provides you with, because otherwise you can't really assess, uh, you can't assess it. The data importer has the superior knowledge. Uh, but of course, sometimes if you just do a bit of Google search, you understand that the respective information is, well, it does not hold up to European standards. Like, well, let's put it like this. Uh, we see that actually quite often. So at least a bit of double checking uh, will certainly very often be helpful. Thanks, Paul. Always good to to uh, to double check the information you're getting. Uh, there is another one. And, you know, there's the last one I'll take. I'm afraid I need to give you all a, um, you know, I've, I've been told I need to give you all a copy break after, after two hours of international data transfers. But there is another one in the chat. Yeah. Um, in how much detail should the annexes be filled out, both generally, but also Annex 2 in particular? Yeah, very good question. And actually, uh, this is um, uh, sometimes difficult. Uh, to deal with also in uh, in particular in intergroup agreements where you very try to come up with a bit broader wording in order to catch everything that is happening. So in the view of the commission and uh, based on the wording of the standard contractual clauses, the information should be much more detailed than it has been in the past. Yeah, in particular also when it comes to technical and organizational measures, uh, you have should mention them specifically for, for each um, data transfer. Um, you, you should explain it in much more detail than in the past, which uh, can make it quite difficult. There are also other hidden issues in the SECs. So you like, for example, you have to mention not only your own technical and organizational security measures, but also those of your subs, which makes it ridiculously uh, difficult because I mean, then you have 20 subs and how long in the chain do you want to go down? In the end, as always, you will probably have to find uh, some kind of pragmatic solution that makes you uh, sleep at night, uh, but, uh, but still is uh, uh, not too burdensome, yeah. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks again for, for all the answers and, and the presentation. Uh, thanks to everyone, all the speakers and everyone who's joined us for this two hours of talking international data transfers. Um, I will now let you go on a little break and send a parallel session. They're starting in about 27 minutes time. So do, do grab a break and uh, grab a coffee and uh, see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks much.